Let's hope you connect this time. There we go. Alrighty. So, um, today we are going to start chapter, what is this, 18 now? Uh, which is going to be on environmental chemistry. Now, interestingly enough, um, this topic, uh, of course, it's a very important one, but it is typically not covered uh, in most Gen Chem 2 classes. So um, this is going to be uh, kind of my first time teaching this particular chapter because uh, most colleges kind of skip it uh, in their curriculum. So we'll see. Uh, so as a result, I'm gonna, as a result, I'm going to be kind of following along with the book a little bit more closely than I would uh, normally do. Uh, and so uh, we're going to just kind of go through it uh, pretty much just section by section. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, today we're going to talk about mostly um, kind of the atmosphere and then kind of air pollution. Those are going to be kind of the big uh, things we're going to be talking about today, specifically the chemistry of these. So, uh, you know, how various species uh, will react chemically uh, in the air or in the atmosphere to, um, you know, as reactions. So we can see what's going to happen as a result of these. And so uh, if we talk about the atmosphere, uh, we're going to have some vocab to talk about first. There's actually different layers of the atmosphere. Uh, we live in the troposphere. That is somewhere between 0 and about 12 kilometers uh, above the Earth's surface. This is where we live. Uh, we live in this uh, particular section of the atmosphere. Um, and we're going to see that we're going to have most of the gas particles in the atmosphere are going to be located in this kind of layer. Uh, we're going to see roughly about 75% of all gases are here, uh, as well as most of the pressure of the atmosphere is also going to be located in this layer. <laughs> After the troposphere, we go up to the stratosphere which is going to be roughly 12 to 50 kilometers above sea level. Uh, and that's going to have about 24% of all gases are going to be located in this layer, the stratosphere. Um, and so as we can see, we, uh, sorry, let me make that a little bit more clear. We're going to see that uh, that's 99% if you add those together. So we're going to see that 99% of all the gas molecules in the atmosphere are located in these two layers. If we keep on going, we end up with the mesosphere, which is, uh, let's see, that one's going to go to about 85 or so. You don't need to, to memorize these numbers or anything. Uh, these are just kind of for your information. And when we talk about certain uh, areas of the atmosphere, certain layers, uh, we'll, we'll kind of reference these numbers a little bit. But again, it's not important that you memorize those by any means. All right. And then uh, the last one we've got is the thermosphere. Uh, which is going to be... 85 to wherever we decide the atmosphere ends, which is usually about 110 or so. At that point, we're in space, like for sure. Uh, what's interesting to note is that these layers are not just arbitrarily defined. So it's not just kind of, okay, we have this, you know, random 12 kilometer barrier. No, we actually have something called a tropopause. At 12 kilometers. Um, and that's going to be kind of 
an area uh, across which not a lot of gases migrate. We're going to see that these pauses uh, are areas where gases don't really go in between the layers. They do it very, very slowly. So gases diffuse across these pauses very, very slowly. Uh, and we're going to see that there's going to be another one, the stratopause in between the stratosphere and mesosphere. And that's at about 50 kilometer of elevation. And then we have the mesopause at roughly 85 kilometers. Again, not, not necessarily important to memorize those. Did you just pee there, mister? I hope you didn't. Okay. Another interesting facet about these uh, is that if we look at the temperature uh, with regard uh, versus elevation, we're going to see that we kind of have this sort of pattern here. And it is curious. And we're going to see that these inflection points are going to be where we have those pauses. So here, at our lowest elevation kind of barrier, that's the tropopause. This is going to be the stratopause over here. And the mesopause. And so it's interesting to note that, you know, we're used to, you know, the idea that the higher you go up, the colder it gets. And that is absolutely true for the uh, troposphere here. So this layer is the troposphere. Stratosphere here. Mesosphere. And then the thermosphere. Um, and so we, we are accustomed to that because that is true in the troposphere. That's where we pretty much entirely exist. You know, even at a plane, you know, when you're at 30 some odd thousand feet, you're still pretty much within the troposphere. So you might vary, you know, depending if you're at a super high elevation flight, you might be in the stratosphere just a little bit. But uh, by and large, you're pretty much always in the troposphere. But what's interesting about the stratosphere is we have the opposite pattern. The higher you go up within the stratosphere, the actual the temperature increases. Uh, and we're going to see that this is going to be primarily due to a lot of uh, light absorbing uh, molecules that are going to be located uh, in that area. Uh, and therefore, them absorbing light uh, is going to increase their temperature. The mesosphere, we go back to kind of being like the troposphere, where we start lowering our temperature again. And then the thermosphere at the kind of very outside uh, behaves the opposite, where it will increase in temperature the farther you go. Um, and so uh, we can kind of see that we can define these layers uh, as where the temperature is behaving uh, accordingly. So that being in mind again, just to kind of uh, clarify, so at the troposphere, again, we have roughly 75% of all gases are here. Um, as we know, gravity, you know, peels off with, with radius, right? So the closer we are to the Earth, you know, that's where gas molecules are held more tightly. And we know that gases are compressible, so just gases pushing down on other gases uh, you know, with pressure like that causes low elevations to have the higher uh, percentages of gas. And what's interesting here is that, uh, you know, we, we are kind of familiar with the gas composition, right? Roughly near sea level, we know that it's about 78% nitrogen. 21% oxygen, that 1% argon, and then we have a bunch of other kind of trace gases like carbon dioxide, water, methane, various sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, uh, other things like that. 
Uh, this is going to be roughly near sea level. And we're going to see that this is actually going to change a bit uh, depending on where we are uh, in the atmosphere. Already, any questions so far on the stuff that we've covered? I want to actually get out some concentration values for these thingies. We can look at some of these uh, gases here. But first, I guess we should talk about uh, how to measure gas quantities. So certainly we can use percents uh, like we do up here. Uh, but those um, those work well for things that are, you know, pretty high percent wise. But they're a little bit harder when we start talking about trace things. And so we often will go back to uh, the unit of PPM, parts per million. Or parts per billion. Um, however, what's, what's important to note here is for gases, PPM is going to be uh, one milliliter over a kiloliter. So we use a volume-based uh, scale here. So with solutions, we talked about mass of solute per mass of solution for our parts per million. Uh, for our uh, gases, we're going to use a volume. And since we know uh, for gases that pressure uh, and moles are also proportional, we could also talk about it uh, if we wanted in terms of pressure. Uh, I'm using atmospheres here, but of course we have torres, millimeters, and mercury, all that sort of thing. Uh, or we could uh, talk about it in terms of moles. I guess I'm, let's do millimoles and kilomoles. That's probably the most common. K-M-O-L. There we go. So any sort of, uh, you know, thing we can use here to, to quantify gases, but typically it is defined as the volume. Uh, we also, I mean, the reason for this is because gases are going to be pretty hard to isolate and they're hard to, um, you know, measure by mass, but uh, volumetric measurements are, are quite a bit easier for gases. So um, just like liquids, if you were measuring them in the lab, you typically measure them volumetrically and not through mass, whereas solids, we pretty much always use mass to uh, measure those. What are you doing on there, mister? One of them is like on the top of the couch behaving like a little cat. What is that last conversion? That's a very good question. It is messy handwriting, um, but it is going to be moles. So one millimole, one kilo mole. You know, any of these would uh, be the same, right? So we could have one mole over just 10 to the 6 moles. That would work as well. So uh, same same with all of these things. So one tor and then 10 to the 6 tor. You know, whatever you want to use. If you want to use prefixes, micro tors to regular tors, it all works. Um, and so uh, we can see kind of... Um, how to use these units, we can do a, a little practice thing here. So if we have that CO2 is approximately 400 ppm, we can see kind of what is, what's its percent. And remember, with uh, gases, when we talk about percentages, those are always mole percents, right? We don't talk about mass percents uh, with gases. So mole percent only here. So that's another way of kind of asking the mole fraction. All right, so if we know that a part per million is one mole per 10 to the six moles. That's a mole fraction, right? One out of a million 
is a mole fraction. It'd be 1 times 10 to the negative 5, <laughs> 6. I guess 10 to the negative 6, right? It would be micro. Um, so uh, with that, we can actually just plug this in directly. So 400 ppms then would be 400 moles over 10 to the 6 moles. And so our mole fraction there would be 0 0.000400. Or if you wanted this in percent, that is 0.04% if you were to do it that way. So uh, carbon dioxide is a relatively small uh, amount by volume or moles in the atmosphere. Uh, at 0.04%, uh, which would be equal to 400 ppm. So as you can imagine, if we have gases that are, you know, contaminants at about 1 ppm or so, it's really kind of silly to talk about them in terms of percentages, uh, just because we can already see here 400 ppm is a pretty small percent, right? And nobody wants to be counting all these decimals uh, up. So relax, mister. You're okay. He's all whining. Okay, so uh, let's get some other kind of gases here. Just so for your own information, what else do we have up here? Uh, neon, we have uh, roughly 18.1 uh, ppm or so in our atmosphere. Helium, we have 5.4 ppm. Methane is 2 ppm thereabouts krypton 1.14 hydrogen 0 0.5 actually uh or it's, no it's 0 0.05 sorry or we could say 50 parts per billion instead we could use that unit instead uh, and then we have nitrogen oxide and xenon Nitrogen oxide about the same, and xenon even smaller, or 8.7 parts per billion there. So just a kind of rough idea of some of these other kind of contributions uh, to our atmosphere. Uh, so we can see here that we have kind of these really, really small quantities of these noble gases We've got a little bit of methane, a little bit of hydrogen, and then some nitric oxide in there as well. Again, these are not things you're going to need to memorize. This is kind of a like for your information type of thing. So you can just have some idea of what we're talking about uh, with these quantities. All right. Pollutants, though, we can talk about. So these are just kind of in normal air. You know, what we would have in if we were to just go to some you know, wilderness location and you were to sample the air, this is approximately the proportion would we, we would get. However, we're going to see in urban areas, we have a number of pollutants here. So uh, when we talk about carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, nitric oxide, ozone, and sulfur dioxide, we're going to see that these become um, significantly higher than they would be in clean air. So uh, if we're looking at kind of, uh, we can see in polluted air versus clean air, uh, what the ranges of these are going to be. So for carbon dioxide, we're looking at about 400 ppm for both. We're looking at ab about the same uh, amount there. However, once we get to carbon monoxide, we're looking at uh, up to 50 parts per million versus 0.05 ppm. So that can be a 1,000 fold difference there. With methane, we're looking at roughly 1.82 parts per million. Uh, about the whole, you know, the whole thing with clean air too, uh, as well as polluted air. Uh, methane is not typically one of the pollutants that we have in urban areas. It's just kind of uh, throughout. With nitric oxide, 
we're looking at 0.2 ppm versus 0.01 ppm. So 20 fold increase for nitric oxide. For ozone, 0.5 ppm versus 0 ppm. Or some uh, records have it as 0.01 ppm. So 50 fold increase. And then for sulfur dioxide, we're going between 0.1 to 2 ppm. And uh, in clean areas, we're again looking at that very hard to measure, uh, 0 to 0.01 ppm. So again, don't memorize these, no need. But just looking at the comparison here, these are going to be uh, pretty major pollutants. We're going to be focusing on <coughs> these three here uh, in this uh, in the course of some of the chemical reactions we're going to look at for uh, atmospheric chemistry and just chemistry of air pollution. Um, the carbon dioxide, you know, of course, comes from combustion. That's its main, you know, uh, production there. Of course, you know, all living things produce carbon dioxide <coughs> if they're going uh, with aerobic respiration. Carbon monoxide comes from combustion as well. Uh, methane comes from various uh, bacteria, protozoans, and then, uh, you know, cows and things, uh, as well as just kind of uh, like fracking uh, will also release methane. We'll talk about fracking later on uh, in this chapter. But uh, those are kind of areas which those would come from. Uh, and we're going to see that nitric oxide and sulfur dioxide are going to be, again, mostly coming from uh, air pollution in terms of vehicles, but also coal burning uh, is a big uh, factor here. And ozone, uh, interestingly enough, is kind of our most common pollutant. Like if you go on your uh, weather app right now, you know, you'll, you'll check out what's the most common pollutant. And by and large, most days it's ozone, uh, especially if you're down in L.A. or more kind of urban areas. Uh, ozone is going to be a very big pollutant. And we're going to talk about the chemistry of ozone later on. So, anyways, let's actually start with some chemistry now. Chemistry time. We're going to see there's two major reactions that will happen uh, with various molecules in the atmosphere, one of which is photodissociation. which is where molecules will simply separate. And we're going to see that another one is called photoionization. And we're going to see this is just going to be breaking bonds uh, in chemical uh, you know, compounds. And ionization is going to be removing electrons from atoms. So uh, a common photodissociation reaction would be something like O2 turning into two oxygen atoms using light. Uh, again, we, we typically talk about light as H nu. Uh, with that, we can see a photodissociation reaction happening. If we look at their, the Lewis structure, What's happening here is we end up breaking this into two oxygen atoms. And of course, as you can imagine, this is an equilibrium reaction. Uh, and, you know, radicals are not very stable. So obviously, we're putting energy in to make this happen. So this is going to be an endothermic reaction. Um, but we can split it into oxygen atoms. And we're going to see that this is going to be a pretty common reaction in certain areas of the atmosphere. Something like photoionization, though, <clears throat> would be something like oxygen gas becoming uh, an oxygen positive ion and an extra electron, just removing an electron there. So we're going to see that these are, are pretty uh, common reactions here. Um, and so we're actually uh, going to be able to talk about the energy uh, of some of these reactions. So let's take a look at the uh, photo dissociation. Uh, 
of O2. I have the value here somewhere. Uh, okay, so if we looked up its uh, bond enthalpy, we would see that it's 495 kilojoules per mole. We could see kind of what photon wavelength is needed to dissociate a molecule of oxygen gas. So, of course, we would need a photon of at least 495 kilojoules uh, per mole to be able to uh, dissociate uh, a mole of oxygen atom, or oxygen molecules. So, if we want to think about that number, so we know how much energy it takes to break a mole of these. So if we want to look at one individual one, we of course can multiply by Avogadro's number to uh, figure out how many kind of, actually I guess we're going to have to divide, aren't we? Oh no. We can use Avogadro's number here. And by doing so, we'll be able to see how many uh, kilojoules per photon we need. Or we can convert that to just regular joules, of course. We always like our base units. So if we do that, of course, one kilojoule and a thousand joules. If we do this, I hope we have the number. Yes, we do. Uh, that is going to be 8.22 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per photon. So technically it's joules per molecule of oxygen, but we know that they're gonna be absorbing one photon, so we can say uh, joules per photon is fine there. And of course, if we remember from way back when, if we wanted to figure out the uh, wavelength, of a particular photon, we would use uh, hc over lambda, where h was Planck's constant, c is speed of light. So this means that the wavelength is hc over e. If we remember Planck's constant, uh, it's that number there. Uh, I have no room to write our speed of light. Let's see. OK, we'll just copy this down here, I guess. Okay, uh, so we'll multiply that by our speed of light. And divide that by our energy. As you can see, we'll be left with a unit of meters, right? Seconds will cancel, joules will cancel. And I have the number here. Doing this math, apparently we get uh, 2.42 times 10 to the negative, oh, forget it, let's just put it in nanometers, 242 nan nanometers. So it would be 2.42 times 10 to the negative 7, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so uh, we will get that as our, our value there, so we can see... If we remember, this is kind of uh, in the UV range. And as we know, the sun definitely produces a bit of UV, right? So we're going to see that uh, this reaction is actually pretty common uh, in the atmosphere. And so we're going to see at different levels, we're going to see that uh, this uh, dissociation happens quite a bit more. And I have some numbers here for us. So uh, if we go super far in the thermosphere, we're uh, about ninety nine percent of the oxygen uh, is dissociated. 
meaning that 99% exists as oxygen atoms, atomic oxygen, and 1% as O2 molecules. And so we're going to see that they're going to be absorbing a lot of the uh, UV energy that happens here, and they're going to be forming uh, oxygen atoms instead. Of course, this proportion is a little bit less uh, the closer we get to the Earth's surface um, because uh, we're going to see that a lot of the energy is absorbed farther out in the atmosphere. But there's still enough. As we know, UV does reach the surface, right? Uh, that's why we have to wear sunscreen. And so this is still going to be happening uh, close to the uh, surface of the Earth as well, at lower elevations. But uh, just kind of throwing it out there that in the thermosphere, things behave very, very differently than they would here. So we actually have oxygen atoms floating around up there uh, far more than we do uh, see uh, dioxygen molecules. Alrighty, so um, if we want to uh, also look at some other processes, if we think about photoionization, If we go back to some of those, we have a couple of common um, situations in which we're going to photoionize. We, of course, could have oxygen doing this too. We can have the monoatomic oxygen doing it. And one important one that we're going to talk about in the next section is uh, this particular reaction where we have nitric oxide. Just some of the, um, the uh, wavelengths that we're looking at here. Let me see, I have these, I have these here, 99.3 nanometers. <clears throat> we can see that these four reactions, of course, uh, would be taking more energy to happen. Photoionizations take quite a bit more energy than dissociations will. Uh, if you want to think about the energies associated with these, we're looking at uh, these values here. As you can see, these are quite a bit higher uh, than the energies that we have holding bonds together. So uh, it's going to take more energy, of course, to ionize things uh, than, uh, than it would to uh, just dissociate them. And so um, there's also an ionosphere uh, that we have where we're going to have a lot of this ionization happening. But this is not something that we're going to talk about uh, in this class. So lucky us. All righty. So uh, we can see here that a lot of, I mean, the whole point of talking about all this stuff is that um, most solar energy is used to either dissociate, those are going to be longer wavelengths, or ionize uh, molecules uh, in the atmosphere. And so we're going to see in the stratosphere, we had that uh, temperature increase as we increase with elevation. Uh, and that is going to be because of a lot of energy that absorption that's happening there, because we also have still a fairly big chunk of all of our gas molecules are located in the stratosphere. And so we're going to see that um, that's going to be a very good place for things to absorb energy. And of course, the most common kind of or most well-known one, perhaps, is ozone. Ozone in the stratosphere it absorbs most UV uh, light from the sun, by and large. We're going to see that its lambda max is roughly 250 nanometers, 
for it uh, for Ozon to absorb it. Uh, and that's going to be kind of smack dab in the middle of the UV range. So uh, it can absorb, you know, things from 200 to 300 nanometers. And it's kind of got that sweet spot at 250 nanometers. Oh, good. He's finally uh, relaxing. So uh, we're going to see here that ozone is typically formed by the following reaction. And we typically will... Uh, indicate this as an excited state because this uh, reaction is uh, exothermic. And there's going to be other things uh, in the atmosphere that are going to help to absorb some of this energy. Typically, uh, we're going to see that this is going to happen with nitrogen gas because that's the most common uh, gas nearby. We're going to see that that O3 molecule uh, can bump into nitrogen. to uh, make the nitrogen excited instead and uh, just have non-energetically exciting uh, ozone here. If this second step didn't happen, we would see that we would end up getting the first are the reverse of our reaction up there, that the energetic ozone would just kind of fall apart back into the oxygen radical and the uh, dioxygen molecule. So um, we're going to see that when you don't have gases nearby to absorb this extra energy from the ozone, we're going to have ozone being unable to form, essentially. The equilibrium would be completely shifted to the left uh, without that. Ugh, go away, phone. Um, and so uh, we're going to see that in different layers of the atmosphere where we don't have a lot of molecules nearby, we're not going to have a lot of ozone formation. So we're going to see that this is um, why O3 uh, is prevalent in the stratosphere. Not only do we have a lot of dissociation happening. So we have a lot of oxygen radicals floating around up there. And then we also have, uh, let's just say, nitrogen and oxygen can accept extra energy, I don't know how to spell energy, energy from excited ozone. So uh, because this kind of, uh, these conditions are both met there, in the other layers of the atmosphere, these conditions don't exist. Either there's just, uh, the higher up you go, the second condition is not likely to happen uh, because as we saw that 99% of the gas molecules are located in the lower two levels of the atmosphere. So the farther out you go, you have, you don't have enough uh, stuff to take away the extra energy. So the ozone would fall apart. Uh, and if you go too close to the surface, you're gonna see that a lot of the energy that would be needed to dissociate oxygen uh, has already been used up. And so uh, as a result, uh, we're going to see that most of this ozone production uh, and these reactions are going to happen in the stratosphere. So again, that's kind of our perfect uh, storm there. Alrighty. So <clears throat> we're going to see that that's about 90% of stuff there. Alrighty. So um, as a result, we're going to see that uh, because of that, we're going to have most of our ozone in the uh, stratosphere. And uh, that's going to be what forms the so-called ozone layer that helps to absorb quite a bit of the UV light that hits the Earth. Alrighty. Any questions so far on this stuff? All right. 
so next section then we're going to talk about how humans messed up the atmosphere that may not be the actual title of the section but it's pretty close so we're going to see that um by a lot of the things that we've released into the atmosphere we've really kind of messed up a lot of these equilibria um, perhaps the most common one is uh, the uh, chlorofluorocarbons. This is kind of the most common or most well-known uh, kind of example of how humans have messed up the atmosphere. So chlorofluorocarbons would typically follow this formula. Very often we're looking at something like this, uh, where we would have uh, something similar to these. And uh, as we know, or let's ask ourselves, which of these bonds is stronger? using what we perhaps remember from last semester about bond enthalpy. Without looking up the numbers, um, we're going to see that the CF bond is stronger, right? For two reasons, because fluorine is smaller and fluorine is more electronegative. Uh, as a result, we're going to have a you know nice polar bond between carbon and fluorine there. Uh, and because fluorine is smaller, you're going to have a smaller bond length. And we saw that uh, the longer your bond is, the weaker it is. So a short bond is strong. And so as a result, by comparison, the carbon-chlorine bond is pretty weak. And as a result, when this uh, dissociates... We are going to get something that has, let's say, oops, we're going to end up breaking some of those uh, chlorine carbon bonds, where we end up with our chlorine radicals. And as we kind of talked about in the kinetics chapter, This very happily will uh, react with an ozone molecule to create uh, chlorine monoxide and oxygen gas. Not a good thing. If we want to look at the rate for this reaction, and this is kind of directly out of your book for this, so let's see. We're going to see that this would be a second order reaction as just, uh, determined experimentally. And we're going to see that the rate, or rather K, not the rate, is 10 to the 9 molar per second. This is an extremely high rate, right? You're reacting a, you know, a billion moles per liter per second. Uh, you know, at the initial uh, outset of this reaction. So this is an extremely fast reaction. And unfortunately, that chlorine monoxide can break down again with light into the chlorine radical and oxygen radicals. And so this is essentially if we were to combine these reactions we're going to see we're going to uh, remove our intermediates and catalysts. We're left with overall
the reverse reaction of our ozone formation. And so this is going to end up having a depletion of the atmosphere, uh, of the ozone in, in the atmosphere. Uh, that oxygen radical, by the way, uh, typically will just react with a second oxygen radical forming uh, an additional dioxygen molecule. So uh, often, uh, I think we saw this pretty much in the equilibrium and uh, was the equilibrium chapter? Yeah, I guess so, or kinetics chapter. Uh, we saw that this reaction is going to be uh, kind of overall summed as two ozones turning into three dioxygens. And so uh, this is greatly, greatly enhanced by the, the presence of the chlorine radical, which would come from those chlorofluorocarbons. And so as a result, chlorofluorocarbons, which are called CFCs, did I write that somewhere up there? CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. These were banned in the 80s and 90s. So um, they were used as refrigerants, aerosols, uh, foam, foaming agents. Uh, as you can imagine, these are not very water soluble. Uh, and so uh, we can't really get rid of them in rain or, or we can't really dilute them uh, through, through that sort of uh, mechanism that we're gonna see we can get rid of some of the other uh, pollutants in the atmosphere through the rain. Um, since they're not water soluble, they don't dissolve in rain, so they're not going to be kind of eliminated that way. Um, but since we know that gases cross the uh, tropopause very slowly, even though we don't have any more CFCs being released, they're pretty much completely gone. Out of out of use, um, we're still having CFCs cross the barrier and deplete the ozone layer, uh, bit by bit, just because these things move very very slowly. So they're just kind of hanging up there at that 12 kilometer area. Eventually, they cross and can break apart into the chlorine radical and cause all sorts of horrible things. But that being said, the uh, ozone hole that was created by these uh, in the uh, in the uh, 80s is slowly regenerating. So thankfully, uh, as a result of stopping the CFCs, getting rid of that catalyst, uh, or as best we can, since it's still going to be somewhat present there until it finally you know, finishes reacting, um, it is slowly regenerating. So the, the hole is getting smaller. It's still there, you know, uh, what are we, 40 years later now. Um, so you can see these kind of changes happen very, very slowly. So, uh, it, you know, it's important that we take, you know, action as soon as we notice something is awry. So you know, even getting rid of these things 30, 40 years ago, uh, we're still seeing the effects of them happen. And so uh, nowadays, uh, we typically use uh, other molecules. We use uh, fluorohydrocarbons. So no chlorines in them, because that was the, the bond that was going to break to make those uh, reactive chloride uh, chlorine radicals. We also just use hydrocarbons uh, in their place. So these were typically, again, refrigerants or aerosol propellants. Uh, pentane is a pretty common one. I think uh, my uh, one of my fridges uses pentane as its uh, refrigerant gas. Um, and so these are, uh, are going to be more common and much more uh, kind of environmentally conscious. Uh, refrigerants. Alrighty, any questions on that?
All right. So those would be CFCs. Let's talk about socks and knocks now. Uh, for these, generally speaking, X would be one, two, or three. So we're looking at sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, we just kind of lump these together. We're going to see that SO2 is a byproduct. Wow, I can't spell byproduct at all. Byproduct of burning coal, which the majority of uh, countries do use as an energy source. Uh, we have China as the biggest one, then India and then the US. Uh, we all burn a lot of coal, uh, releasing a lot of sulfur dioxide. Um, but again, this is kind of um, something that's been somewhat fixed. There, there have been kind of um, measures taken to reduce the amount of SO2 being released through coal by either using low sulfur coal or by uh, using other agents to kind of precipitate out some of these uh, sulfur dioxides. The reason that these are problematic is because if you take uh, SO2 and oxidize it, say with ozone perhaps, we end up making sulfur trioxide and dioxygen. Uh, there's numerous, numerous oxidizing agents in the atmosphere, so nitrogen oxides can also act as oxidants but this is just one example. We see how that when we um, mix sulfur trioxide with water, we get our dear friend sulfuric acid. And if we see that we uh, do the same thing with nitrogen dioxide, we get nitric acid if these two were to combine. And overall, these strong acids, these strong aqueous acids, uh, amount to what is called acid rain. Where we uh, have the pH of rain is roughly 5.6 or so of kind of clean rain where it's slightly acidic due to carbon dioxide. But acid rain, we have a pH of about four or so, which is pretty significant, right? That's well over 10 times more acidic uh, than, than the water would normally be from the rain. And this is problematic because many structural stones are carbonates, specifically calcium carbonate that's in limestone and marble. So these are common materials in buildings. Marble, of course, uh, used in statues as well. <clears throat> and so we're going to see that carbonates, as we saw in the last chapter, uh, normally are insoluble in water, but when you acidify the solution, uh, you can end up reacting away and dissolving your uh, carbonates. And so we see these guys will dissolve in acid. And as a result, you end up with structural damage. Exactly. because calcium oxide is does not have the same properties as calcium carbonate. <clears throat> calcium oxide is lime, of course. Uh, and so we're going to see here that um, because of that, you know, you can have structural weakening. 
uh, where things can collapse or break down or etch uh, and simply become unsafe as a result. And, you know, they estimate, you know, every year it's billions of dollars of property damage uh, that arise due to uh, acid rain. Of course, <clears throat> the acid rain also acidifies bodies of water. Wow, I can't spell that. We're going to talk more about water pollution tomorrow, but <clears throat> when, when uh, certain bodies of water who do not have good buffer systems <clears throat> get acidified, that leads to fish death, bacterial death, bacterial death, plant death as a result. Uh, and so these lakes or, or ponds or whatever become completely, you know, just dead as a result. Uh, and so it, that, you know, it depends what kind of body of water you're looking at. You know, it depends on the minerals nearby. So some bodies of water have a lot of bicarbonate or carbonate in them um, just because of the minerals nearby, which can act as buffers to kind of mitigate this. But some uh, some bodies of water don't have these buffer mechanisms. And so you end up killing the fish populations. Other vertebrates and invertebrates also die uh, as a result uh, of the acidification. So uh, bad things happen. So sad face. This whole chapter is going to just be big sad face. Um, so this is a problem, right? And so uh, as a result... we kind of want to mitigate socks production. That's what we want to do. Mitigate uh, to diminish, make smaller, get rid of, fix, fix the problem. And so we, we have some solutions here. Oops. One is to use low sulfur coal. However, this is less common, more expensive, and uh, also produces less energy uh, when it's combusted. So as you can imagine, there's a number of problems here, right? Nobody wants to spend more money to make less heat. I mean, it just is, you know, it is anti-capitalism, uh, as it were, but it's also less common, so it's even, even more expensive. So uh, it's there's kind of a lot of bad things that unfortunately will limit the use of low sulfur coal. Um, and so our kind of other options are to remove SO2 once it's produced. And uh, I guess we'll talk about that tomorrow because we're, we're out of time here. So uh, we'll, we'll finish this kind of section talking about how humans have messed up the atmosphere. Um, and uh, then we'll start talking about water next time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and probably put up your homework later today just so you guys can kind of see what sort of uh, questions we're going to be working on uh, with this. So because uh, it's kind of really its own special chapter. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it's quite a bit different, as you can see, from, from the other chapters. We don't have nearly as many calculations, you know, as we've had pretty much the, the entire rest of the semester. We've had solution calculation, equilibrium, kinetics, all these other calculations. This one is quite a more conceptual stuff or just idea-based. So, um, well, well, it's a little bit different. So, cool. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Enjoy your Mondays. Uh, and yeah, we'll continue then. So enjoy the rest of your day.